Am I live yet? Yes. Good morning. If you're on Facebook joining us, we still, again, we invite you in here. Um, we've got some renovations going on, but we got plenty of space for you, and we would love to have you. Um, but because you watching online, you missed the walk-up song, but it was Earth, Wind, and Fire. Do you remember? And this sermon is going to be about remembrance today, but I just kind of wanted to share with you what my week was like this week. I told you Wednesday I went over and saw Tomlin. Thursday night was supposed to be my day off. We did get to go to Zephyr Hills. For you veterans, it's a top secret thing that Kimberly and I learned. If you go to the Great Catch in Zephyr Hills, they don't advertise it, but they give you a free meal. Uh, not a 10%, not a 20%. I got my sh boom boom shrimp and my clams free. I put it out on Facebook. They say you got to ask for it, but we got it free. Got my haircut that morning free. And that's because people still honor and recognize those who have served. So I thank you for that. Thursday was that, and Thursday night was a concert. Friday was a football game. We went down to Venice, and the highlight was not our 55-7 to 7 score where we lost. Uh, but those who went to Durant, y'all lost 55-6. to 6. Sorry. Um, my principal will be proud that I shared that. But was this. This is our governor of our great state of Florida, and he came to the game, and I made sure that I knew he was going to be there, so I gave him a Raider polo shirt, Raider football polo shirt, Nike shirt. So he's got one of those, and he came over and talked to us, and it was good to see the crowd and to see there. So that was my Friday night at 5 a.m. the next morning. Uh, I had got up and went and played golf on Saturday. Golf. That's the next slide, Sam. There he is. Look at that right there. You see what that says? That's the One Accord Church, Pastor Randy Humphrey. We sponsored a whole. Y'all give, give me a round of applause. There you go. And then here's where my sermon's going to begin. Just stay right there for a minute, Sammy. So, I played golf in the past. I played in high school, and I have clubs, and I know how to do it. It just doesn't always turn out the way I think it should. Like, I'm the only guy in the world that can hit a 90-degree shot. I can actually hit it. It turns right 90 degrees. It goes out of bounds every time. Um, but going around, I was so excited. I did not tell two of the gentlemen I played with. One is, uh, works with me. as a Mr. Hearn. I told them I would say their names. They're like, really? I said, yes, you're going to be in my sermon because I said, I can make a sermon out of this. And they go, no, you can't. Hopefully they're tuning in. Mr. Hearn, Mr. Mike Wachowski, who's been around Plant City and Durant for 16 years, and now he's an AP at our school. Uh, he was one of my, he was my cart mate, my buddy. And then another guy named Frank. Frank, if you ever watch this, I said your name in church. He didn't believe I would. And so we're sitting there and we're going around. And if you've ever been to a golf tournament, there are other things that go on other than golf, and I understand that. We're not naive to think uh, there's a reason why they have the 19th hole on golf courses. That's where they go. Some people call it the bar. Some people call it the 19th hole, and I'm okay with you, whatever. You do you. I'm going to do me, and I'm going to do Jesus really well. And we're going along, and we're having a great morning, and this was our uh, probably about the 12th hole that we played, and we pulled up, and I ran up to the sign, and my buddy Frank, who was just a great guy, he, all of a sudden, I went over and I kneeled down beside him. I said, take a picture. And he goes, oh, my God, you're a pastor? And I'm like, yes, I am. And this is our hole. This is our hole. And I took the picture with it. And he goes, well, you better play really well. Well, here's the story of the day. The rest of the day, they let me putt, especially with it, if it was six inches or closer, they would let me putt it in. So it, I, I can make that putt pretty much all day long. So take me to putt putt. Most of the time, if you've ever played in a scramble, you hope they get to use one of your shots. And they did use maybe one of my shots the whole day until we got to our hole. And all of a sudden, they're like, well, you better play better. This is your hole. And so we get up, and they tee off, and it was pretty good. But one guy went a little further, so it was a par five. And he, he got it down there. So all of a sudden, I said, well, I don't have anything to lose. My shots aren't used very often. So I pulled out my hybrid, Eddie. I pulled out a hybrid um, driver wood slash kind of club, and I got up. And I said, well, what the heck? Boom, right next to the green. They're like, what is that? Man, that where'd you get that from? You haven't, you haven't showed any type of ability all day. And all of a sudden, I said, it's my hole. It's our hole. It's our church hole. All right, so that next up, they shot. They decide, okay, somebody chips up. We get it on the green. We're putting for birdie. It's about, I would say, 15 to 20 feet out, and I sink it. That's a different hole. You know, you're changing. You turn this fan off. 
Since I ain't got no fans in the back, I might as well turn this one off too. Right here. <laughs> but I sunk the putt, and they're like, that was our first birdie of the day. We shot four under, which was honest. We don't make scores up like some of the other teams did, I'm sure. But we played fairly well, and, and, and it was our first birdie. And, and Frank looked at me and goes, you should have put the sign at every hole if you're going to play that way. <laughs> and all of a sudden he said that, and I'm telling you, when people say things, they become sermons to me. And as soon as he said, this is your hole, this is your sign, and you should have put a sign at every hole, that's because at that moment there should be a sign everywhere for us to remember. God throughout the Bible talked to his people and said, I need you to put things in place so that you will remember. And, it, and here's the sad thing about that. A lost world will tell you, what a selfish, haughty God. Like he, he literally says, build things to me so that you'll remember me. Think about me. No, it's because he knows us. He knows in the midst of struggles and strife, the first thing we do is not think of him. We don't immediately remember. Oh, I remember my teaching in Sunday school. Oh, I remember the Ten Commandments. We're out doing the wrong thing and hoping that they don't catch up with us. We don't remember those things. So scripturally, biblically, he talks about how we're supposed to remember God. So if you have your Bibles, this morning's sermon is going to be stones to remember. We're going to be in the book of Joshua. My team, my golf team, yes, a sermon came out of that one hole, our first birdie. And we're going to be talking in Joshua about how we're supposed to remember if you have a Bible like mine, you're on around, let me see, page 3, 350. Joshua 4. We're the only church. I'm going to try to buy Bibles for everybody so we're all on the same page. Joshua chapter 4. We're beginning on verse, um, pages 338. Stones to remember. How many of you know this story? You can raise your hand. That's right. There's so few of you. Thought about getting stones and putting them up on the stage. But here's what it is. God's talking to his people. And we often think of God as only dealing. That's why I like our prayer chairs. I like when our kids ask for prayers for parties. Well, that's really not where. Listen, God's in the details. The smallest of details. God is so much in the detail that he looked at his people and said, You're going to cross a river and I'm going to be there. Not the Red Sea. Not changing the world with, with a word, but I, you need to get across the river. And you need to take my authority and my power. We call it the Ark of the Covenant. And we're going to take it across that river. And guess what? I'm going to be there for you. And when I am there, people say, well, it was a raging river. Listen, it was a river. But he was there because he had a path. Eric, he had a path for your life. So he wants you to remember that along that path, he's going to be there in all the details. For some reason, we think we have to wait till the end. We've completely messed it up. We've completely are out of our own league. We can't take care of things. Why do we all of a sudden think that everybody has to be, or God has to be the lifeguard, right? Why not get in the shallow waters? No, we like to swim in the deep. And then when all of a sudden we get in trouble, hey, God, throw me the lifesaver. Most people will tell you that statistically, they have studied the black boxes on airplane crashes. And over 80 plus percent of them, the last words as a plane is crashing, and it's, there's nothing you can do, is, oh God. People at their darkest hour cry out to God. But yet in their midst of their everyday life, we should remember Him. So everybody has their Bibles on Joshua chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, when the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, here comes the scripture on the screen. Choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe. Let's don't leave anybody out. When we're doing remembrance, uh, uh, kind of Veterans Day, but we're remembering God and who he is, let's don't leave people out. When we think about God and what he can do and what he wants to do and what he will do, let's don't leave people out. Well, he's just going to do that for the church people. You know that God loves unchurched people. Absolutely. What? He doesn't. They don't know how to act. Eric, you can wear your pajamas any time up here, brother. Don't ever let me hear you say, I didn't dress for the occasion. You come as you are. You come when you need to, and God will move you. God loves his creation. Isn't it weird that we will pray a prayer that God knows that us intimately enough that he can heal ourselves and our bones and our marrow and our, everything about us? He knows our brains when we have tumors. He knows our eyes when we need things. 
And, but he doesn't know that about all. Yes, he does. He knows that about everybody. And so let's don't pick and choose. He picked all, representing each of the tribe. And in verse 3 he says, And tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from the right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you, and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. God is not wimpy or reluctant to do God's stuff. We're the ones that still have the reluctancy and say, well, he might heal you. I love, we don't pray that way, Robert, right? We're, we are going to pray it. And people will say, well, you prayed and it didn't help. And that's because I'm praying it in the power and authority of God, but he's still God. And he's still in ultimate control. And he's telling them, take stones where you're standing now because when you get to the other side, isn't that beautiful? When you get over, meaning, man, I'm going to get over. God's word tells us when we get to eternity, means we're going to get to eternity. God tells us when we are healed, we are going to be healed. These things that we have to understand is that God's talking about you now, but he already knows where you're going forward. And he said, take 12 stones, and I want you to take them over there where they, you're going to stay tonight. We're going to make it. Listen to you. Listen to me now. We don't lose in the end. Amen. Nowhere is there a scripture or a thing that says, if this happens, then God will be victorious. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say if this church of one accord will get six people saved in the next two years, then all is well. It doesn't say that. If we could get everybody else to join a church in America, it would. No, it doesn't say that. It says he is, he will, and he shall be. It's already done. He's already told us the end of the story. Today we're going to be watching football. Bucks play at one. Someone gets you out of here, get home, get, get to the Bucks, right? I think Murray's already over there. Murray, are you at the game? You probably are. Telling, and you probably are. But DJ told me one o'clock. When we look at a sporting event, the one reason why we like to watch it is we don't know how it ends. If you would have told me Friday morning that we're going to travel an hour and a half down to Venice and take three buses that cost us a lot of money and we're going to end up with a 55 to 7 loss, I would say, we're not going. <laughs> when it was 42 to nothing and a half, my principal, I text her, she's not in town, but I sent her a message, score is 42 to nothing. She goes, can we leave? <laughs> listen, we're people, listen, hey, let, let me just admit this. We're not focused on losing. We will not go and give our 110% and do everything we can and knowing we're going to lose. If you ever have a coach that comes up to you and, and my, my football buddy, buddy's back there, if you ever have a coach that says, we're definitely going to lose tonight, it's going to be horrible, but I want you to give it your all. You look at it like, oh, that's not the way it is. Looked like the Florida Gators heard that before their game yesterday, and I thought they were going to lose. But they didn't, thank the Lord. Here's the deal. God knows he incorporates everybody, and he's telling you to go forward. But when you do, don't forget who got you across the river. We celebrate when we're on the other side. Yay. Many times, a lot of us that I'll call church people are celebrating that we're church people, but we never knew how we got over to this side. We have forgotten that. We know more about where we sit. We're laughing about it. People sitting where you're supposed to sit. We know more about what color. Listen, Deborah walked in today and it took her a few minutes before she looked around and goes, there's no windows. It is amazing how distracted we are by the things that we have put together and we forget who got us over here. Lest not us, we be the ones that ever forget. In verse 4, it goes on to say, let me catch up where I am. Verse 4 says this, so Joshua called together the 12 men he appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe. And here's what he said to them. Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. What? That's a raging river. I'm telling you, go. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites. Man, now i got to carry something? Listen, if God gives, you to it, gives it to you, carry it. I carry a pocket knife when I can. Why? Because it just makes me feel comfortable right there. I have my wallet usually here, but I take it out when I'm preaching, right there. There are certain things that we will carry. Listen, I'm a Second Amendment person all day long, and I am glad that some people get to carry. 
I am glad about that. I said that a lot on Facebook. I am glad that we have that ability and that opportunity and that freedom. It's amazing. I'll wear this necklace that I have every day since I left Egypt. I can't think of a time unless I went to surgery when they asked me to take it off that I've taken it off. There are things that I will carry with me. And here's what I'm telling you. None of those are important as the things that God gives you. When God says carry this, you best be carrying it. He says, go into the middle of Jordan, each of you, according to the number of the tribe, and serve as a sign among you in the future when your children ask you. How's this going to help me now? In the future. How's living right as a parent going to help you? In the future. Let me tell you. Say it all the time. If you see a child that's in distress or if you're dealing with something and they may not be able to adapt to the things of society, meet the parents. Because you're going to see what was taught to them. You're going to see. And you know what? Most You can predict what their future is going to be like by looking at who they're dealing with right now. He says, in the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, before the power and authority of God, before the spirit of God ever proceeded. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. The river stopped. All of that, that, that struggle, all of that strife, it stopped. These stones are to be memorials to the, be a memorial to the people of Israel. When? Forever. How long do I got to remember that? Forever. I don't ever, I do observations at school all the time, and I don't hear teachers saying that. I need you to remember this. To win. Forever. Used to be with Clayton, I would say, I need you to remember this. Well, when's the test? Because he's going to flush it right after. <laughs> I'm, I'm Seriously, he was one of the few kids or students I ever had, and it was a true statement. A lot of them lie and tell you, I test better. No, that's just laziness. He could say, I want to test better. He would do nothing and could absolutely ace every test. That he had it there. It was there. Listen, when we're dealing with God things, it's supposed to be forever and eternal. If you don't remember your salvation moment, why would you forget that? A brand new creature in Christ was created. You remember and we celebrate birthdays of babies. I remember that so well. Mom was telling birth stories the other night. Just I remember and, and you're this and, and, and all. You remember that day. We remember these moments. And it's amazing that we'll remember those things, but we forget the things of God. We forget the moments of God. And we forget that all that He's done. He says, we need you to remember that forever and ever and ever. Here's what those stones, those 12 stones the Israelites carried across. The 12 stones that were placed so perfectly were supposed to be reminders of three things. And I'm hoping that you'll remember these things today in your life and your love of Jesus. I hope you remember the past. Some of you are going to say, well, I'm a new creature and I don't remember the past. Listen, there are times I pray, Lord, please let me forget that one. Have you ever been sitting there and something creeps into your hot head about a situation or a moment? It happens to me this way and it probably happens to most of you. When you're around your buddies and they start to remember when, you're like, Lord, I tried to forget that one. Yeah. And we think as believers or as church people, we're supposed to completely forget I'm supposed to completely forget my college days. Not happening. I'm supposed to completely forget my high school years. It's not happening. I'm supposed to completely forget the time when I was in the military, single, traveling all over the world, doing whatever I wanted. I haven't forgotten. But the past reminds me of what he has done in my life. The past completely reminds me of that was then. And this, I said it yesterday on the golf course. Somebody approached me and said, why don't you do this? And I said, I don't know. Well, you probably did it in the past, and I'm, that's the past. And I'm not that way anymore. And that reminds me of what he has done. Not the fact that I walked down the aisle, not the fact that I rededicated my life, not the fact that I got baptized, but that he, the Lord himself, saved me from that past. Those stones remind me. They remind me about the present. Stones remind us, of, of us that he is with us. When they crossed over that river, they looked and they said, you know what? He was with us when we were crossing the river. Well, we had the Ark of the Covenant. We had the authority and power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, but God himself was with us. He is always with us. And if you ever forget that, sad. 
You can forget other things. We don't forget numbers. We don't forget our telephone number. Well, I'm talking to classics. Many of you have forgotten your phone number. How many of you have because it's just a button on your phone now? Yeah. I struggle every time I have to put Kimberly's phone number anywhere because it's like, oh, what is that one? George, I have no idea. Birthdays, things like these things that we forget. Some people in the old days, you have to memorize that. We don't really have phones. I take pictures of it. It's right there. But when it comes to God, don't forget that he is with you. When you're facing a tough situation in your life, the rivers of life are flowing so fast that it looks like a flood, uh, flooding and that it's going to overtake you. Don't forget, he's with you. He's with you on this side of the river. He's going to be with you in the river and on the other side of the river. The stones remind us that he's with us. And the last thing I think is where we kind of lack the, mo the, the most is the future that stones remind us that he will forever be God. If you live in a fear that one day he's not going to be God, you got to quit. That's not faith. Faith is knowing that he is God, that I am not. He will be with me, and he's always got what's best for me, that he's always got the strength and authority. He's always the, the attributes of God, omniscient, omnipresent, um, um, what other ones? What is it? Omnipotent, the power, the presence, the knowing. He was omni over all of those things. And he doesn't change. 2021 didn't catch him off guard. God is not reeling from COVID. God didn't have to get vaccinated from COVID. God didn't go through any of the generations, A, B, C, D, or whatever they're coming up with next. God will never have to go through what's 2022. We're all sitting here going, oh, Lordy, what's it going to be like next year? Can gas get any higher? God can't get any higher because he's as high as he'll ever be. And why do we forget these things? He will forever be God. I am thankful that he got me through the rivers of the world. I am thankful that I crossed over. He has a child. I understand. I walked down that aisle. My mom followed me right in line. And we got baptized there at First Baptist Church of Dover together. Didn't change me completely. Somewhat. It gave me a true understanding of who he was. But I still had to choose, as Dad said so perfectly earlier. We still have to accept that. It took me a long time to accept my salvation. It took me a long time to live in my, or live out my salvation. It wasn't until I was a grown man with a family stationed in Fort Hood, Texas, and I heard a 13-year-old girl tell me about her life-changing experience. I was like, did my life change? It's not too late. The Lord spoke to me that night at a church there at Copper's Cove, Eastside Copper's Cove, and I got up after that young lady. I went up there. I was the education um, pastor, and I was the worship pastor. And I walked up to our pastor and said, listen, ha, that little girl just testified that she had a life-changing experience. I need to have that same thing. And from that moment on, I know exactly who I'm living for and who lives for me. That's Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. And those stones remind me of that. We need to be moving forward. Joshua 4, 24. At the end of this, at the end, because if you read the text, don't get lost that it happened twice. He told you it was going to happen. It happens, and at the end, he summarizes it in verse 24. He did this so that all the people of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. When you do things, when you walk your walk, when you talk your talk, do the people of the earth around you know that the hand of the Lord is powerful? Do they see weakness? Do they see um, inability or, or, or lostness inside the church? When you look at statistics, yes, yeah, statistics will tell you it's as bad inside the church as it is outside the church. So I'm asking you this morning, when you walk out and you remember what he's done in your life and who you are with them, and then he goes before you, are other people recognizing that? Do they see a powerful God so that you might always fear the Lord your God? That's right. I fear the Lord my God. I'm not scared of him. But I fear in awe of his authority and his power over my life. I fear in just reverence the amazing things that he's done. That he does, listen, the best thing about pastor is to get to look at y'all. Not that you're that great looking, but looking at y'all, 
I, I believe every pastor can say this, especially in a small church. I know all of you. I can write a story about your lives. Some of you are like, don't write that story. Some of the chapters wouldn't be so beautiful. They'd be very colorful, Miss Edith, but they wouldn't be beautiful. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Got her boots on. The truth is this. I see how amazing God has been in your lives. That's not because of me. I take no credit in that. I share words that he's already written. If you would listen the way I do, many of you would come to church on a Sunday because I believe he speaks corporately and already know what I'm going to be talking about. You would say, he told me that this week too. I believe that every one of you has heard the word of God. You've seen it lived out. You've remembered the stones and all the things in his power and authority. And now look what he's doing in your life. The testimony of the church is in your lives. If we invite someone in through these doors, guess who they're going to talk to most? You. Not me. The old sheep begat sheep, right? They're going to come and talk to you. They're going to sit with you. I don't sit out there. Not because y'all have cooties, but I just don't sit out there. Pull a red chair up here. I can sit in my high and mighty red chair. I don't do that. You are the ones, and they see your testimony. We have to realize that we have the power to live it out loud so other people, they may never come to church. It didn't say, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through the church. It doesn't say that. It doesn't have us in there anywhere. What? We can rewrite it. No, we can't. It's only through Jesus. And if you're not introducing them to Jesus, you have knocked the stones over and you don't remember how great he is and is in your life. That's what you've done. You just kicked him to the side. Oh, I can use those stones. They can be in my garden. So you took them up. No, don't forget who he is. It was perfect that all of this came together on veterans kind of remembering, right? Because when you think about it, if you look it up, Google it, it's always about remember. Kimberly used to sing a song, Remember Me. Schultz or whatever it was, he used to sing it. It was beautiful. It was the first song we ever sang together, like as a duet. I would sing in the background of her because she, do, she does the singing, I just follow her. But we remember things. Today, the stones also remind us to remember our veterans. The stones that they placed before us. There were 12 in this example in the Bible, but you could go through the stones of freedom. The stones of protection. <clears throat> Think about all the things that we take for granted. They just happen. I don't fight my way to work every day. I didn't shoot somebody to get gas this morning. They didn't do that. I'm not worried that all of a sudden we're going to have to get our gear out because we're going to in an attack. I don't think right today. I don't believe today that anyone from outside of the United States is going to attack our country. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't fear that. News might want to try to stir up a little fear in you, but you should never let them be the ones to dictate. If it's not the word of God, why are you listening to that? Today, the stones remember our veterans. JFK said it very well as the president of the United States. As we express our gratitude, we must never forget that the highest appreciation is not to utter words, but to live by them. Don't talk Christianity to people. You don't have to know the Roman road or the faith outline. What you need to know is Jesus. Amen. You need to live that out. More people are going to follow your life's examples than your words. When you express words, you sound self-righteous. When you express those words, you're going to sound a little haughty, a little higher than they. Listen, when I listen to other people's words, I look at their lives. We have some great examples in this room of people that put words out all the time and their lives back it up 100%. They know who they are. I tell them. I hope when I speak my words that my life backs that up. I hope when I say I want you to come and and be here at church because I, because we'd love to have you. They realize I love them already. Words are dime a dozen. Some of you speak better, have big words. Some of us not so big words. They have words in the dictionary every year. They're completely made up words. George has made up a few words in his life that are absolutely wonderful. 
happenstance, first set, first set should be in the dictionary. You don't know whether to say for this reason or except, so you say first set. I think that should be in the dictionary. It works really well. I'm not asking about your words today because y'all are really quiet. I'm asking about your lives. Do they show a remembrance of God's power? Dear Holy Father, I do pray again over our veterans, veterans' families. I pray, Lord, that we will continue to see people rise up true heroes to serve and to protect, to raise their right hand in, and to utter those words, which is an oath. But most importantly, they live that out. We as Christians this morning, we as believers, we as the way, as it was called, may we be less about words and more about action. May we always remember, first and foremost, what you've done in our own lives. So that we can live in the presence and in the present moment with you. Knowing that our future is secured by you. Lord, I ask you again, bless these people. Take this church outside of the four walls. Lord God, if we could, we'd take off the front wall at all just so people could just come in. Because we want people to know you. We want to be able to introduce them to you. We want them to be able to come to a moment where they say, I want to be different. I want to see that transformation. I want to experience the newness of Christ in me and that they will confess with their mouth and believe in their heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. My prayer is today that if someone is sitting here and they hear this or they're on Facebook and they don't have the stones of remembrance to, to remember that moment when you created a newness in them, I pray, Lord, that this be their day. November the 14th, 2021, be the day that they truly confess with their mouth, believe in the heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord of their daily lives and of their eternal life. I pray that people receive you. Thank you for receiving us. In Jesus' name.